Jesus, and um, I want you to pray for Mallory. She led our uh, service today and did such a great job, but she's um, got a really tough back issue and is in a lot of pain, and so, um, you know, a lot of times we, we meet people that need prayer and we go, oh, hey, I'll pray for you, man, and then we don't, right? So how many of you would commit to praying for Mallory? Raise your hand. Amen. Okay, good. God bless you. And um, we're looking forward to seeing uh, God do some great things through this. Uh, we had a innocent it uh, yesterday morning. And uh, if you saw some pictures on Facebook, we had a, uh, I was up in my office studying and all of a sudden, bam, the whole house shook. And I, th- I thought we had an earthquake. And uh, I thought that or the whole house just fell on Jill. And uh, so uh, I jumped up, ran downstairs. And as I was coming down, Jill was coming back in from the porch. And I came out and uh, a car had ran in over the curb and right into our front porch. And uh, so, um, so by the time I get out there, there's a this is a kid standing out on the sidewalk. He's got pajamas on and boots and, and um, looks kind of disheveled. And so I said, hey, were you driving this vehicle? And he said, yeah. I said, what's your name? He said, uh, uh, what was it? Um, Alexander. Yeah, he said, Alexander. And so, <laughs> so I, uh, I said, uh, what happened? He said, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I said, really? I said, uh, uh, how did you get on the curb and into our porch? And he said, you know, normally he said, I'm a really good driver. <laughs> you know, everyone has a bad day, right? <clears throat> anyway, it, it was uh, really sad. He comes from a really dysfunctional situation. Both parents uh, are drug addicts, and uh, he really doesn't have a whole lot of chance in life unless somebody intervenes in his life. And so, anyway, pray for Alex and um, that God will use this to help him come to a place where he can know Jesus. Um, in the, uh, the, we have three weeks before Easter. Easter is a big deal here, and we uh, invite unchurched people to come to our services, and uh, we've really tempted to do three services as you see this one's pretty full but uh, we're just going to you know uh, ask a lot of you to move to the first service try to leave some seats to the second service we'll talk more about that in weeks to come but we have three weeks before Easter next week I'm going to talk about the Antichrist who he is what he's going to do during the tribulation and then I'm going to address uh, the battle of Armageddon how, when Jesus comes on a white horse down Uh, at the end of the tribulation, and uh, we're with him. And so we'll talk about that the week after, and then we'll end the series on the subject of the millennium. What will happen during the thousand years when Jesus is here uh, ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, and we are going to rule and reign with him during that thousand years, and what that'll be like, what the earth will be like, and and, uh, you definitely don't want to miss that. So um, then we'll have an Easter service and we'll pray that we'll see a lot of people come to know Jesus as their Savior. That's really what Easter is all about. And so I uh, hope that you'll pray for that. Someone asked recently, <clears throat> why should we spend so much time on the second coming of Christ? There are so many other felt needs that need to be addressed that people are dealing with. Why spend so many weeks on the second coming of Christ. One pastor said, prophecy distracts people from the present, from the present. Well, if you were sick, not feeling well, and you went to the doctor and he uh, looked at you and said, hey, what can I do to help you? What's wrong? And you said, well, a lot of things. I'm having a hard time hearing. My foot's not working right. My arm's not working right. But he said, you said also, you know, I have a constant uh, ache in my heart, my chest feels heavy, and he would probably say, you know, proportionately, the most important thing that I think we should start on is your heart problems. So there is a principle of Bible study, and it is this. It is called the law of proportion. 
you can discern the importance of a subject in Scripture by how much attention is devoted to it. So when we look at the Bible, God devotes a lot of attention to certain subjects. Did you know, for instance, in the Old Testament, God spent 10 chapters about the tabernacle, about the construction of it, how it was supposed to be put together, 10 chapters. It was, it was really important. It was the place that he was going to show up and he was going to demonstrate his presence and he wanted them to get it right. And so when God spends a lot of time in the area of scripture, so should we. So how much proportionately does God say about end times, about prophecy? Well, the percentage of the New Testament that is prophetic is 21.5% of the New Testament deals with prophetic things. Of the entire Bible, there's 27% of the entire Bible is prophetic. Of the 333 prophecies concerning Christ, only 109 were fulfilled the first time he came. That leaves 224 yet to be fulfilled in his second coming. And if he fulfilled the first one, he'll fulfill the next. And then <clears throat> there are over 300 passages to the Lord's coming in the 260 chapters in the New Testament. That means one out of every 30 verses speak about he's coming again, he's coming again. 23 of the 27 New Testament books mention the Lord's second coming. So it must be pretty important. And then people are encouraged to be ready for the return of Jesus over 50 times. God says, hey, get ready. Jesus is coming back. You better be ready. He's coming back. So the message from the New Testament writers on has been we should be prepared for the second coming of Christ. He could come at any time. So today, I want you to know that Bible prophecy is like GPS. When you plug in a GPS coordinates, it immediately tells you how far it is, how long it's going to take you to get there. And the closer you get, it's easy to see on your GPS just how close you are. And I believe we are getting closer than we ever know to the second coming of Christ with all the things that are taking place. We're going to mention some of them today. Of all the things that proves that the Bible's true, you may be a person here today that says, you know, I'm not sure that the Bible's even true. I mean, how do you know that man just did not write the Bible? Somebody said to me in the middle of the, uh, the services, they said, well, I have a, a son who doesn't believe. He says, how, you know, the, it could have just been written by a man. How do we know that the Bible is really the word of God? One of the greatest proofs that this book is written by God is prophecy. Did you know that there's nothing in Buddhism, Hinduism, or Islam that is prophetic in nature? There's only one book that says, here's what's going to happen, and it happens over and over again. That's the Word of God, because it's written by God. God knows the future, and He can tell you what's going to happen, and it happens. So one of the reasons we know this book is alive, it's the Word of God, is because in its nature, it is prophetic because it's written by the God who knows tomorrow. So my purpose today, in, in part, is to strengthen your faith in one particular area. And that is your faith in the New Testament Word of God, the Scriptures. I want you to know that you can trust the Bible. Our relationship to God is based upon trust. Just like your relationship to any person is based on trust, your relationship to God is based upon how much you trust Him. And your measurement of how much you really trust Him is measured by how much you read this book. Now, a lot of you say, well, I, believe, I really believe the Bible. You just never read it. Well, if you really believe this, this is the Word of God that is alive and it is accurate and it is God's love letter to you, man, you should be reading this Every day, multiple times a day, you should memorize the scriptures. And so God wants you to trust him and trust his words. It's kind of like kind of going to a new restaurant. You know, when you go to a new restaurant, you go by faith. And you go in there and you, and you have a meal. We just went to a new restaurant here recently. And man, we wow, it was really good. And we're going to go back. We're, as a matter of fact, we've told people, hey, you ought to come go with us to this new restaurant. Good food. And... Uh, and you go in and you trust by uh, tasting some of the food. 
And God said, listen, if you'll take some of the food here, you'll like it. It will be a blessing to you. It'll encourage you and help you. So I would encourage you today to know that God wants you to trust him. Now, uh, to the timeline we've used over and over again, there are three positions that people have concerning the rapture. It's not debatable if the rapture is going to happen. All Christians believe that there's going to be a snatching away, hapazo, uh, catching away of the saints. It's the wind that's going to happen. We happen to believe in a pre-trib position. We believe before the tribulation, the rapture is taking place. There are people who believe that halfway through the tribulation, we're going to go up. And, um, and there's reasons why I don't accept that. And then there are people who are post-tribulation. They believe that right before Christ comes, we go up, meet him, come right back down. Kind of like a U-turn. And, uh, and uh, uh, that doesn't make sense at all. And so, um, so today, I want to give you one of the reasons why we, are, we hold a pre-trib position. And, uh, and it's based upon this particular truth. We believe that God made an everlasting, unconditional, that's the key word, unconditional covenant with the nation of Israel. And uh, it comes out of Genesis 15. I don't have time to give you this background and turn there and read these scriptures, but I want to tell you about this covenant that he made with Israel. He made it with Abraham. He was the father of the Jewish nation. And there was a thing called a blood covenant. Now, a covenant is different than a promise. I can make a promise to Larry based upon my word. And I can say, I promise that I'll be there at a certain time, be, and I'll do certain things. I promise. Now, that's a promise. But a covenant is different than that. When you get married, you are making a covenant. Marriage is called a covenant between two people, both promising each other to come together and live together and honor God and, uh, and obey the Lord. It's a covenant. So in this time <clears throat> with Abraham, God said, I want to make a covenant. And so they would take large animals, they would divide them in half, and then they would set them aside, and they would make a path wide enough for two people to walk through. And it was called a blood covenant. And it was saying that I am promising and coveting with you to keep my word upon my death. I promise you that if I break this, I should forfeit my life, my blood to you. It was a blood covenant. That's pretty serious. It'd be nice to have, you know, when you bought a used car, say, hey, you're going to take a blood covenant? This car's good. <laughs> and uh, uh, so... Um, so Abraham was asked by God, and he set up this blood covenant. He set up the animals, and the Bible says in Genesis 15, he was, he was keeping the, all the, the bird, the vultures off of him, and he was waiting, and the sun started to go down. And as the sun went down, the Bible says that God put Abraham into a deep sleep, and he never walked between the animals. Only God walked. Abraham did not participate in the covenant. Instead, he was a recipient of the covenant. Abraham made no promise. Only God made the promise to Abraham to fulfill his promise to the nation of Israel. And the promise between God and Israel rests totally with God. God said, I'm, I am promising upon my name and who I am that Israel will always be my people. There are a lot of people that are Christians who do not believe that God is still working with the nation of Israel, that he has rejected Israel because they rejected Jesus, and now he's focused on just the church. And um, that cannot be. That's impossible if this covenant is true. And so God wants us to know that God gave birth to the nation of Israel and to Abraham's descendants, and uh, it's an everlasting covenant. The only way to really understand the book of Revelation properly is to believe that God is continuing to work through the nation of Israel to bring them to a place of repentance. And so today, 
We're going to look at two chapters. First, Ezekiel 36, and um, uh, Israel's idolatry brought God's discipline. And um, let's, uh, let's begin with verses 1 through 7. It says, God rebukes the nations that came against Israel. In the first seven verses, we're going to see where God is, um, he, he made this happen uh, when Babylon came in to take Israel and, uh, and to bring judgment in 586. So 586 years before Christ came, Israel uh, is going to be dispersed and never again to be a nation for 2,500 years. Here's what it says. And you, son of man, prophesy, preach to the mountains of Israel. So it represents all of Israel. And say, O mountain, mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. He says this six times in seven verses. Thus says the Lord God. Because the enemy has said to you, aha, the ancient heights have become our possession. So the enemy had come in and taken the land. And therefore, preach and say, thus saith the Lord God, because they made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side, so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations. And you are taken up by the lips, and, uh, the lips of talkers and, and slandered by the people. Therefore, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, valleys, desolate waters, the cities that have been forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations around. Therefore, says the Lord God, surely I have spoken, watch this, in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and, uh, and against all Edom, who gave my land to themselves. Whose land does it belong to? It's the only place, only place in all the world that God said, that's my real estate right there. The land that I gave Israel... I gave them a title deed to that land and them only. No other nation has that in the world but Israel. So God said, this is my land. And if you come against Israel, take Israel's land, you're not just coming against Israel, you're coming against me. And God said in my jealousy, in my anger, I'm going to discipline the nations that have done that. Who, uh, with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds, in order to plunder its open country. <clears throat> Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. Therefore, says the Lord God, I have raised my hand, watch this, in an oath that Surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. When do you feel shame? When you've done something wrong. And those nations were going to feel the shame of coming against Israel and trying to possess the land that belongs to God. God said, I swear it. So you don't want to be on the other end of God swearing against you. And so Israel here is a, uh, a country, a, a nation that has land given by God. Just how much land do they have? How many of you, anybody been to Israel before? A few of you. And so Israel is pretty small. It's smaller than the state of New Jersey. And um, now I want, uh, I think I'm going to start on this slide and then come back. So <clears throat> here is the nation of Israel right here in yellow. And uh, it's surrounded by, uh, there's Lebanon, there's Syria. You hear about these uh, nations in the news. There's Iraq, uh, Kuwait down here where we fought wars, um, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. So they're surrounded by Arab nations, see that? But how much land did God give to the nation of Israel when he promised them the land? Well, it was much more than this. And... Um, so uh, here is the, here's the land that God gave. God said to uh, Abraham, if you continue to read in Genesis 15, from the Nile River, which is in Egypt, to the Euphrates River, he said, that is all your land. 
So all of Jordan, part of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, part of Egypt, that all belongs to Israel. When are they going to get all that? <clears throat> during the end of the tribulation, during the millennial reign, Christ will rule from Israel and all this will be Israel. So <clears throat> there's only um, really one time in history when um, King David, after um, he was finished, they had quite a bit of this. Solomon extended the borders, but they never possessed all of the land uh, as they were supposed to. So <clears throat> God said, it is my land, and he's going to defend it. So he says <clears throat> in verse 22 and following, God defends Israel for his namesake. This is interesting. He says, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not Watch, I do not do this for your sake. God said, you're, you're not something special because you're Israel. I gave birth to you, but I want you to know what I'm doing is not because of you. And I, I want you to know if you're a child of God, God didn't look down and say, well, I sure wish you were on my team. I mean, you are special. No, no, we're, we become special when we say yes to God through Jesus and accept his grace. That's what makes us special in him. And uh, he said, what I'm doing is for my namesake, O house of Israel, but uh, for my holy namesake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. Um, he goes on to say, I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. You know what he said to Israel? Listen, I want you to be a testimony. I want you to be a testimony of my grace. And I want you to be a witness to all the nations around you that if they would follow your God, Jehovah, I would bless them like I'm blessing you. And instead of Israel being a missionary nation, they became an isolated nation. They hated anybody that was not Jewish. They became prejudiced to the core. And they would have nothing to do with people that were not Jewish. God never intended it that way. He wanted them to be a witness of his grace in that nation. And instead, not only did they not witness, but they began to adopt the habits and follow the gods of the pagan nations. Because you see, those pagan gods were into sexual immorality. And if you went down to the groves where the pagans were worshiping, well, that's where everyone got naked and had orgies and got drunk with drugs and had hallucinations. And it was a free-for-all in the name of this pagan god. But they also sacrificed their little children. You would have to bring little babies and sacrifice to their gods. So it was a wicked, pro that's why God says, you have profaned my name. You have disgraced me, and uh, you have done everything against what I've asked you to do. There in the midst, the uh, nations uh, shall know that I'm the Lord, says the Lord God, when I'm hollowed in you before their eyes. Now, you want to know how God feels about this? Watch. I go back to verse 17, same chapter. Son of man, while the house of Israel lived in their land, they defiled it with their conduct and actions. Their behavior before me was like minstrel impurity. Want to know how God felt about that? What could be more putrefying than that rag? God said, I want you to know that's how I feel about what you're doing. So if you don't think that God feels deeply about sin, he is illustrating that with what Israel did before him. He goes on then and says in verse 24, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. So he said, listen, I'm going to bring you back. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and of all of your idols. It's coming. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh 
and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you will keep my judgments and do them. The only hope that anybody has in this world of walking with God is coming to a place where you allow Jesus to come into your life because then he puts his spirit within you and you have a desire to follow him and walk with him. And he makes you a new person. And then he said, then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. So God promised in this passage of scripture that although he disciplined the nation of Israel, he was not forsaking them. Now, you may say Israel was really bad. That was terrible. I want you to know the American church is not far behind that. The American church has walked away from God. We've traded the true gospel for the social gospel. And there are denominations that are with one, they have one breath left. I mean, they are selling property and selling churches and they are dissolving. The church in England and Canada is almost extinct because they have forgotten to preach the word of God. And so churches are dying. It is the Laodicea time. And I think we are headed in that time with a president, vice president, and a denomination that believes in killing babies, 60 million of them we've done, and God will not spare America uh, when we have done just as wickedly as the nation of Israel did. So <clears throat> you say, well, God had every reason to divorce Israel. He should have started over. Yes, but he made an everlasting covenant. He said he would never divorce Israel. And, uh, and he won't, and he'll continue to bring them to a place of repentance at the end of the tribulation. And I want to say to you, if you're here this morning, and you have walked away from God, and maybe you're coming back for some reason or another, I, I want you to know, God doesn't, he doesn't put his hand out and say, well, man, I'm not sure I want you back. God doesn't do that. And God sees your heart, and if you want to walk with him and you want to ask his forgiveness, God runs to you like the prodigal son and hugs you and welcomes you back. And he wants you to know he loves you today. And so God never rejected Israel. He's still going to work through them. And God wants to restore you and wants you to walk with him. He says in verse 34 through 36, he is going to declare to all the nations through the reestablishment of Israel, who he is. He said, the desolate land shall be tilled till, and instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. I'll explain that in a moment. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become, wow, like the Garden of Eden. Um, and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord God, have rebuilt the ruined places and have planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it. I will do it. Man, I like that. I like when somebody says, I want you to know something. I, I said it, I'll do it. I'm a man of my word. Well, I, I like that, but I like it when God says that, Amen. And God says, you can count on that. You can take that to the bank. I'm going to fulfill my word. Well, <clears throat> I want you to know, Israel, after 2,500 years of nobody doing anything in that country, that place was ruined. I've read testimonies of people that went to Israel back in the 1930s, and they said, nothing will ever grow in this land. It is a desolate place. And then God said, he brought Israel back. Today, after 2,500 years, Israel's been back in the land for 72 years. You know the, uh, the irrigation drip system? Most of you have heard of that. You know who invented that? Israel. Israel did that in order to preserve the little water they had, and they have turned the desert into a tremendous produce um, a Garden of Eden. They are exporting to Europe more fruit than anybody else. $1.3 billion a year. Um, Israel was the first one to figure out how to reclaim almost 90% of all of their wastewater to be used again by their population. Consider some of the contributions Israel's made to the world. Between 1901 and 2018, 
There's been approximately 900 Nobel Prizes awarded to all different fields, science, economics, literature, peace, technology, etc. Of the 900 Nobel Prizes given out, the Jewish people have received 203. That's 23% of the total Nobel Prizes given to Israel. Now, the population of Israel compared to the rest of the world is not 1%. It's 0.2%. They're a very small nation, less than the uh, the, uh, state of New Jersey. Only 10 million people, and yet 23% of all the Nobel Prizes. Um, On the other hand, the Muslim population represents 23% of the population. They have received in the same length of time only 12 Nobel Prizes. Now, I don't say that to throw them under the bus, just to say to you, it is clear to the world, anybody looking, that God's hand is on the nation of Israel, and he is blessing that nation in spite of their rejection of their Messiah. So you say, well, if that's true, then why is it the world in general hate the Jews? Two reasons. One, out of envy. You notice when you do well, people that around you not doing well don't seem to like you well. <laughs> And, uh, and the Arab nations are watching Israel prosper, and they hate it. There's a second reason. The enemy of your soul hates Israel, Satan. He can't do anything directly to God, so he's going to do everything he can to hurt God's nation. And he has tried to obliterate the nation of Israel for years, and he hates them, and he's trying to still persecute them, and he will do that during the tribulation as well. So the promise is, God said, I'm bringing the nation of Israel back into the land, and I'm going to bless them, and we're seeing the fruit of that take place right now. They are stronger uh, militarily, economically. uh, They are producing more technology than just about anybody in the world. So how did this happen? Watch. There's There's the miracle of the rebirth. He gives us a visual of why this is so important to God and to us in Ezekiel 37. And uh, one of the reasons you know that God wrote the Bible, nobody could think this up. And when you hear this passage of Scripture, I mean, nobody could sit down and go, okay, here's what I'm going to, and write this. This is beyond comprehension of any normal person. And so here's what God said. And before that, let me just say to you, God promised uh, uh, something to do with Israel that he's never done, no other nation has ever done. And that is, he said, I'm going to give birth to you in one day. One day you're not going to be a nation, next day you're going to be a nation. That has never happened to any nation in the world. America wasn't, didn't become a nation overnight. It was always a process. But God said here in Isaiah 66, 7 and 8, before she was in labor, she gave birth. Huh. Before her pain came, She delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? That's exactly what God did with the nation of Israel. When all of a sudden the world agreed with our president in 1948 to make that group of people a nation, And May 14th, it happened in one day, fulfilling prophecy. Well, in Ezekiel 37, he describes it. Ezekiel now is writing about uh, the nation of Israel, and he's going to describe what they look like from God's standpoint. The hand of the Lord came upon me, Ezekiel said, and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, And it was full of bones, human bones. And uh, what kind of bones? And he caused me to pass by them. He had had me walking up and down and around. And behold, there was a lot of bones, a whole bunch of them, in this open valley. And indeed, they were not just dry, very dry. In other words, they were like, man, they've been dead a long time. And uh, so um, Ezekiel's describing the spiritual condition of Israel, and saying, this is what you look like in front of me, because you've rejected your God. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Interesting question. 
Hey, he said, Ezekiel, he said, can, can life come to these bones? And Ezekiel probably said, you know, Lord, that's really above my pay grade. And uh, um, only you know that. And I don't know you. I, don't ask me that again, please. And so, uh, so can these bones live? And he, Ezekiel said, well, Lord, you know, it's up to you. And you're the one that gives life. And so he said in verse 4, and again, he said to me, preach to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You know, there's only one thing that brings life to anybody. Spiritual life only comes through the word of God. You cannot come to Christ without hearing your need of Jesus through the word. And so God said to this preacher, preach the word. And uh, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And he said in verse 6, and I will put sinews, that's all the ligaments on you, and bring flesh, all the organs will come in upon you, and then I'm going to cover them with skin, and I'm going to put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Everything God does in Scripture is to demonstrate that he's real to you and to everyone around them. He's trying to convince people, don't live life without me. Well, Ezekiel goes on and says, so I preached, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was preaching, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. All of a sudden, he's, it's like going over there to the graveyard across the street and preaching to the graves. I mean, that'd take some faith, wouldn't it? Go preach. Hey, folks, I'm here to preach to you today. Uh, 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 can I get an amen? And, and uh, I, you hope, you'd hope you don't hear one, right? And, uh, and so uh, Ezekiel's preaching these dead bones, and he's preaching, and he's preaching, and all of a sudden... Man, they start moving. Uh, the, the ankle bones connected to the shin bone. And the shin bone connected to the knee bone. And all of a sudden the thigh bone. And all of a sudden the hip bone. And then the backbone. And bam, 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 these bones are coming together. And not just one, but multitudes. And man, I think the angels were really smiling, saying, man, we haven't seen anything like that. And uh, so it was quite a scene. And Ezekiel's watching these bones come together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh, organs, came upon them, and the skin covered them. Watch, but there was no breath in them. So there's a lot of bodies, but no life. And I want you to know, there's a lot of people that go to churches that are dead churches. And unfortunately, there's a lot of pastors that are preaching to dead bones. I'm glad I'm not one. I'm glad this church is not dead. Uh, and, uh, amen. God bless you. So um, um, Ezekiel is preaching. There's no life in them. Listen, you don't have life because you're religious. You only have life if Jesus comes into your heart. You only have life if the Spirit of God enters you. And so <clears throat> Ezekiel uh, went on to say in verse 9, and he said to me, preach to the breath. Preach, son of man, and say to the breath. The breath is another word that we uh, understand from the Old Testament is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, Spirit of God, and breathe on the sl slain that they may live. And there's, I can't say anything that caused people to have eternal life. Neither can you. There's only one person that gives eternal life as the Holy Spirit. And we depend on him to take the word and help you understand your need. He goes on to say in verse 10, So I prophesied and he, as he commanded me, and breath came upon them. And they lived, and they stood on their feet, but they were only able, able to walk with a walker, and they just kind of stumbled along. Is that what it says? No. The Bible says that God wants you to be a living army. You know, an army is an army with force when it comes together. And that's why God gave us the church. 
The church is a place for Christians to rally together and to stand with one another and to fight together. And when somebody goes down, to help pick them up and get them back so they can march again with us. God wants us to be an army of the living God together. And that's what the New Testament is supposed to be. And so God wants us to know that we depend upon his spirit to work through his word to change people uh, and cause people to come to know him. Well, he goes on in verse 11. And he said to me, son of man, these bones, watch, are the whole house of Israel. So he's given us a clear picture of what Israel looked like. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. I bet you everybody here knows somebody that is lost and dried up. You know, you can't find purpose in life without Jesus. You can find money, you can find homes, you can find cars, you can find titles, you can find prestige in this world. You cannot find meaning and purpose without Jesus Christ. And so God wants you to know, like the nation of Israel, there's a lot of people that are dry without any hope in this world, and they need the Lord. And he goes on in verse 12, says, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open up your graves and cause you to come up from your graves. The graves picture the outlying countries and places where Israel was scattered and bring you into the land of Israel. That is happening today. God is calling the Jewish people back to Israel, and there's an explosion in population there. Over 10 million Jews have now living in the land. And um, then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you from your graves and put my spirit in you. That's going to happen at the end of the tribulation when one-third of the nation of Israel it repents and, and recognizes Jesus as their Messiah. And you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and will perform it, says the Lord. So God wants us to know that he has a plan and a purpose for Israel, and his purpose is to help us to see that he keeps his promises. And this is an incredible story to describe to us that <clears throat> God wants you to know there's hope. But you have to be a person who stays in this book. You have to be a person who believes that God has given us a living word. You know the difference between this book and every other book is that it is live. You know what that means? That means that when you read it, it is present tense. That means like my words right now are alive because you're hearing them present tense. Every time you read this book, it is present tense it's as if Jesus was right there speaking to you. That's why when you read this, you get convicted. That's why when you read this, you get hope. That's why when you read this, you go, man, I love this. I'm learning something about God because this book is alive. And so God wants us to know that if we're going to have a relationship with him, it's going to be based upon our relationship with Jesus through that word. Today, <clears throat> there are a lot of churches that are described <clears throat> as uh, dying in this world. They don't have any joy. They don't have any excitement. I'm glad Crosspoint's not one of them. And uh, God has a purpose for this church to reach Missoula. And God wants you to be a part of that and help us to reach people. It all begins when somebody says, I need the Lord. And you know, there are people that live around you that are dead without hope. They have life, physical life, but they don't have spiritual life. And God has called you to be a missionary to them. You're the only one probably that they will ever meet that knows the Lord. And if you don't say something to them, probably they're not ever going to have somebody else say anything. I mean, you think about your life, if you didn't receive Christ until later on, how many people actually witnessed to you in your life? So God has put us in a place to be mission. There's, there's not a better time than right now. People are scared to death in this world. And they don't know what's going to happen. 
and they see changes taking place, and many of them they don't like. And, uh, and it scares people. And there's only one cure, and that's the cross. Unity, the, the equality movement uh, that they are trying to push, is not between black and white. Equality is found at the foot of the cross. That's where we all become one in him. And God wants us to know that you and I are a part of that. So today, I, I want you to know the hope that we have is in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Maybe you're here today and, and uh, you've gotten off track. You've uh, been running out the weeds and, and uh, the world's beat you up. And you've come back and kind of wondering whether God will have you back. And I'm here to tell you that God loves you today. And he will welcome you back with open arms. If you'll just come back and say, Father, I've, I've sinned like the prodigal son. And I want to come home. God will welcome you back and so will we. I wonder today with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're a Christian but you're not walking where you should and you know it, and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I'll, I'll get my life back in the place where I can be used by the Lord again. And you'd say, remember me in prayer. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me. That's me. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if you're here and you have never invited Jesus in your life. And... Uh, you don't know if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. That is a terrible place to be. And you can resolve that today. You can invite Christ into your heart today and know that you're going to heaven. Your sins are forgiven and you're a child of God. And I wonder if you're here today and you say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not a Christian, but I want to be. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me? That's me. I'm not haven't made that decision, but I want to make that decision. Father in heaven, I thank you for everyone that's here today. And I thank you, Lord, that uh, you've brought people with different needs together. One thing we have in common is we need each other to stand together and encourage one another. And we need you, Lord, as never before. And no matter what happens in this nation, no matter how far it runs off the rails, God, we know that you're in charge. And uh, our hope is not in the White House, it's in you. And so I pray that you'd give us a heart to reach the lost, to be a light, to be a joy, to be a testimony, to uh, look for things to encourage people with. Bless our people and strengthen them. Thank you for those that are here visiting today, and I uh, pray that you would encourage them and help them to know this church loves them. We want to help them make the rest of their life the best of their life. And so God, give us a great week. If you're wanting prayer today, right at the end of our service, we sing a song. We hope that you'll come forward, come down here by the baptism, and there'll be some people here that'll pray with you. And some of you men and women that are mature leaders in our church, I hope that you'll come and, and be here and pray with folks that'll come to pray. Let's stand to our feet as we sing and close in song. <clears throat>